king, pharaoh, president, prime minister, or CEO was ever lived has died, or if they're still living, will die. The one exception is Jesus Christ. He wasn't a king in the conventional sense, but he had a kingdom. It wasn't a kingdom of this world. It was the kingdom of God. Christ overcame death. He rose from the grave and ascended to heaven. North Korean dictator Kim Jong-il died last year. He was buried, and he's still there. He's still in the grave. North Koreans deified Kim Jong-il during his life. They thought of him not just as their leader, but as their god. They even believed he had supernatural powers. They believed that the mood of Kim Jong-il controlled the weather. So uh, they even ascribed supernatural powers to him. They truly believed that he was a god. In the schools, the school children are taught that he was immortal, that he would live forever. So I'm assuming it was quite a surprise when he died in December. I mean, this person they've been told in their schools would live forever. Um, immortal gods just don't die. This problem of dying has hounded god kings for thousands of years. The ancient Near East, which is the culture around the Israelites, so it's the context for the Old Testament, has a story about a king who dealt with the same problem. His name was Carrot, and it was believed by his people that he was the son of El. It was not unusual for gods to have human children. As you um, probably know, again, the stories we're most familiar with, we're thinking of gods, probably the Greek gods. Those are the stories and tales that are made into movies a lot. Zeus had lots of, you know, half god, half human children. Hercules is one of the examples. So it wasn't unusual for a king like this to claim, you know, I'm the son of El, who was one of the main Canaanite gods. So it was believed that he was a god or the son of a god. And he threw a big banquet that he invited all of his commanders to. But when the commanders got to the banquet, they were told that instead of having a nice banquet, they were supposed to mourn because the king was very ill. And the king's son, Ilhu, came to the king, and uh, this is what he said to his father. How can it be said that Carrot is the son of El, the offspring of the wise and holy one? Or do the gods die? So here we see that same problem popping up. If you're going to call yourself a god, we run into one major problem. Gods don't die. Unlike the Babylonians that we talked about yesterday, um, Nebuchadnezzar built a gold statue. Some have suggested it may have been a Nebuchadnezzar himself, but it was unlikely. That was not something the Babylonians claimed for themselves. They never claimed that they were God. The kings a lot of times claimed to be messengers for God or claimed that they were kings because it was approved by God, but they never actually claimed to be God themselves. But the Persians, it's a different story. They believed that their um, God, their kings, were gods. The Persians were like the Babylonians in that religion often had as much to do with politics as it did with piety. When some of the officials proposed to King Darius that he should pass a law that nobody in his kingdom prays to any god except for him for 30 days, he probably saw this as a good way to centralize his power. It wasn't that he believed that he was the only god. I sometimes wonder about these kings that claimed they were god. They had to have known that they weren't really god. Um, but I'm sure he was flattered, and he also saw this as a way of centralizing his power, if everyone could pray only to him. Of course, they had other gods, and they could pray to those other gods after those 30 days, but a period of 30 days that everyone prayed just to him. And prayer was extraordinarily significant in Persian religion. A large portion of their holy writings that we have are formulas for prayer. If they wanted something, they would have, you know, kind of like mad, let's fill in the blanks prayers, this is how you pray for that. And they believed that prayer almost had magical qualities. They believed that you know, if you followed some of these formulas, these prayers, that the gods had to do what you asked, that they would provide that for you. God does not look kindly upon kings claiming his role. Um, in the New Testament, Herod meets a very grisly end because he just doesn't correct the people when they call him a god. And we see that story in Acts. In Acts 12, 21, it says, On the appointed day... Herod, wearing his royal robes, sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of God, not of a mere mortal. This must have been some speech. Most people change the channel as fast as possible when they're flipping past C-SPAN. 
When's the last time you heard a politician speak and thought, wow, he must be a god? I know the answer for me, never. But here, here it is giving a speech and the people shout out, wow, this is not just the voice of a man, this must be the voice of a god. And then in verse 23 it says, immediately, because Herod did not give praise to God, an angel of the Lord struck him down, and he was eaten by worms and died. If someone ever tells you a God, make sure you correct them right away. Peter actually had a similar situation in um, Acts. It's also a kind of where people confused Peter and were wanting to worship Peter. And Peter said, no, I am not a God. Only God is worthy of that. But Herod maybe liked the attention, felt the flattery. He didn't correct them. And he was eaten by worms. And then a grisly end. And I have here on your handout, we've got the king in today's story, Darius. Uh, he was a king. And not only was he a king, he was a king over a great empire. We talked about how great of an empire Babylon was. The Persians conquered Babylon and expanded that empire even further. So he was a king of a great empire then, what would have been the entire known world at that time. The people prayed to him. We pray to God, um, so we see that. But there's one thing, you know, that happened that shouldn't have happened to a god. He died. The same thing with Kim Jong-il. He was a dictator. He was a leader, his people were devoted to him. They even said that he had supernatural powers. They said he could control the weather. They even said that when he was born, there were earthquakes and all these things heralding his birth. But again, we saw just last year, he died. So we've got Christ, and you know, Jesus, who is Christ, that's his title, not his last name, you know, and Christ and is the position he holds. He's king of the kingdom of God. He performed miracles. And he did die, but there's something else I was able to add to this list. I can add to the list for Darius or Kim Jong-il. He rose from the dead. And that's because Jesus is the only one in all of history that can make a claim to being God. And in the showdown yesterday, Babylonia was the empire in charge. And um, we've been going through the Bible looking at the confrontations of God versus God, but kind of as a side to this, We've also been looking at the history of God's people. Uh, we didn't look at the early history with Abraham and Jacob in um, Genesis. We started with Exodus. But they escape from Egypt, and they come into the promised land that God had promised them in Canaan. And they eventually have their own king, but they begin to stray from God. They begin to worship other gods. And this eventually leads to a split in the kingdoms. We've got the northern kingdom of Israel that um, generally followed other gods, and the southern kingdom of Judah that um, generally followed God. And because of their unfaithfulness, God allowed another empire, which in this case was the Babylonian Empire, to come in and first defeat the kingdom of Israel, but eventually Judah. They weren't following God all the way either. They were conquered as well, and they were taken into exile. And God was allowing this as punishment because they were not faithful to him. But he didn't allow Babylon to stay into power forever either. They stayed into power for about 70 years, when another empire, Persia, came along and defeated them. And it's the Persian Empire that is in charge now. So yesterday when we looked at the Babylonian Empire, they were a great empire with great riches. They had gold and money coming in from all of their kingdoms. They were building giant gold statues. They were building the Hanging Gardens, which is one of the ancient um, wonders, of, one of the wonders of the ancient world. They ruled the known world. But none of those things are eternal. They were conquered by the Persian Empire. Judah had been invaded when Daniel was just a teenager. He was invaded by the Babylonians, and he was carried off to Babylon. And he had lived his whole life away from his homeland, in a foreign land with foreign gods. Yet he had never turned from God. He still loved and worshipped God. He had been promoted to a high position in the Babylonian government. Now, 70 years have passed. He's in his late 80s. He's an old man. And a new government comes in and takes over. The Persian government's in charge. But they saw that there was something different about his life. We'll see in um, Daniel 6, you know, that he had some excellent quality about his life. And we know what that was. It was because he had God in his life that they saw something different. And so the Persians also promoted Daniel to a high level in their government. So not just one foreign government, but two foreign governments did Daniel have a very important and high position. And in Daniel 6, it begins with the Persian king Darius, and he's looking at his great kingdom, and it's so large that he's having problems controlling it all, and so he's devised a way to help him 
administer all this area. And in the first verse of Daniel 6, it says, It pleased Darius to appoint 120 satraps. And this is the name that the Bible gives to this position that he was um, creating to rule throughout the kingdom. So he decided, you know, I've got this vast kingdom, and to help me administer it all, I'm going to divide it into 120 satraps. It'd be like we have 50 states or provinces. So he was dividing it up to, uh, into 120 provinces, and each of these provinces would have their own governor or leader. But then he created another position just above that. Verse 2, with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. So he divided his kingdom into 120 provinces, and then he created three high administrators that these 120 leaders answered to. And then these three leaders answered to the king directly. And it was one of these three leaders that the 120 answered to that Daniel was appointed to. So Daniel was just a step under the king in the chain of command of Persia. And then in verse 3, Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities, those exceptional qualities because he had God in his life, that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. So not only was he already one of three that everyone else answered to, and then he answered just to the king, the king loved Daniel so much and saw how important he was and how different he was that he was planning to give him an even higher position probably second only to the king, over the whole kingdom. And in verse 4, at this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs. But they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him, because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. So, of course, all of these other three leaders and some of the leaders below that they were jealous. They didn't want Daniel to get such a high position. He wasn't even a foreigner. They wanted this position for themselves. So they began hunting for skeletons in Daniel's closet. And lots of times politicians do have skeletons in their closets, things they're trying to hide. But they quickly found out this wasn't true for Daniel. He didn't have anything they could uh, use against him politically. So they had to decide to use God. And continuing on in verse 5, it says, Finally these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man Daniel unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So these administrators and the satra, satra went as a group to the king and said, May King Darius live forever. The royal administrators, prefects, satraps, advisors, and governors have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anyone who prays to any god or human being during the next 30 days, except to you, your majesty, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now your majesty, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put the decree to writing. Once a Persian law was signed by the king, it could not be changed, not even by the king. Later, a Greek historian told the story of a Persian king who sentenced someone to death and almost immediately decided that he had made a mistake and not to, but it was too late. Not even the king could reverse that order, and this person was put to death. So it was an absolute law that once the king signed something, it could not be changed. The reasoning behind this was a god could not be wrong. If a god was to change a law that he made, he had to admit that he made a mistake that he was wrong about that law. Because the Persians believed that their gods were kings, once something was said, it had to be right. It was said by a god. We see this also in the book of Esther, which also took place in the Persian Empire. In Esther, in the first chapter, in verse 19, it says, Therefore, if it pleases the king, let him issue a royal decree, and let it be written in the laws of Persia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vashti is never again to enter the presence of King Xerxes. Also let the king give her royal position to someone else who is better than she. And then also in chapter 8, verse 8, it says, Now write another decree in the king's name, in behalf of the Jews, as seems best to you, and seal it with the king's signet ring, 
for no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. Once a Persian law was signed by the king, it was with his rings on it, it could not be changed, even by the king. If you're familiar with the story of Esther, you'll know that Haman, sort of like the um, people in this story, have tricked the king into passing a law that is not good for someone that the king cared about. He kind of tricked the king into letting him write a law that was bad for the Jews. And even when Esther brought this to his attention, he couldn't change this law. The laws of the Persians cannot be changed. What he did do was make another law that allowed the Jews to defend them, gave them weapons so that if anyone tried to enact the law that Haman had put into place, that they would be able to protect themselves from it. But he couldn't just reverse a law that had already been put into effect. And then continuing on back in the story in Daniel, in verse 10 it says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to the upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem, Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. The law just said, you know, it didn't say you can never pray to another God, it just said for 30 days. And so maybe it would have been easy for Daniel, I mean, he's been working so hard for God for 80 some years, he's an old man, you know, 80 days not to pray, you know, that's not too long, you'll start praying, you know, right again after the end of those 30 days. But no, Daniel was still faithful, he still prayed three times a day. And it says here, you know, to do that, he went up to his room and he looked out his windows facing Jerusalem. And this is how God had instructed them to pray while they were in exile. And we see this um, just after Solomon had built the temple. And it's in um, 1 Kings 8, in verse 44, um, Solomon has just built the temple. And here is Solomon talking to the people and, and talking to God. And he says, when your people go to war against their enemies... Wherever you send them, and when they pray to the Lord toward the city you have chosen and the temple I have built for you, and that city was Jerusalem because that's where Solomon had built the temple, then hear from heaven their prayer and their plea and uphold their cause. So he said, whenever the people go into battle, whenever they're away from home, they're going to turn and they're going to face Jerusalem where I've built the temple to pray to you. Then we skip down a few verses in verses 48 and he says, um, he's talking here, you know, and if we don't repent, if we're taken into exile and we're in a foreign country, but we're there and we have turned back to you, we've realized you know, what we did was wrong. And if they turn back to you with all their heart and soul and the land of their enemies who took them captive, and they pray to you toward the land you gave their ancestors, toward the city you have chosen and the temple I have built for your name, then from heaven, your dwelling place, hear their prayer and their plea and uphold their cause. So Daniel was following the instructions that Solomon had given he was praying daily, he was praying to God, and he was facing Jerusalem as he did this. And so now, the officials, they think they've got him. They knew that Daniel would be faithful. And in verse 11 it says, Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, Anyone who prays to any god or human being except you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. The king cared very much for Daniel. He didn't realize what this law was going to do, and he was very upset now. Then the men went to, as a group to the king Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring, and with the ring of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. It was common um, in, for the Babylonians um, to penalize criminals by throwing them into a fiery furnace. 
But when the Persians took over, they did away with this practice. And this was because the Persians worshipped fire. So they viewed using fire or a fiery furnace as a means of capital punish to be inappropriate. So their preferred penalty, when somebody had done something wrong and was condemned of a crime, was to throw the condemned prisoner to wild animals. And uh, sometimes it would be lions, um, and in this example it's you know, a den of lions that they're throwing the condemned criminals to. And so the story goes on. Um, Daniel's in the lion's den, and it's been sealed so that nobody can um, sneak in the night and try to let Daniel out, not even the king. And verse 18 says, Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. And I'm sure he didn't expect to hear anything back. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel answered, so he heard something back. May the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight. Nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. At the king's command, the men who had falsely accused Daniel were brought in and thrown into the lion's den, along with their wives and children. And before they reached the floor of the den, the lions overpowered them, and crushed all their bones. It was common in the ancient Near East, not just for Persia, that if someone falsely accused someone else, and it was found out, then they would be punished in the same way, or the same punishment they were seeking for the person they were falsely accusing. And actually, we see this same thing happen in Esther. Haman had built gallows to hang Mordecai on. And what happened when he was found out? Haman was hanging on those very gallows that he had meant for Mordecai. So this was a common thing for Persians for the ancient Near East. Um, if you brought false accusation against someone, whatever you were seeking against them would happen to you. So they were thrown into the lion's den. And it says they were also thrown in with their family, which seems odd to us. You know, our laws only allow us to punish the person, but in Persian law, if a person was punished, often his whole family was punished. So their whole families were thrown into the lion's den. And then the end of the story, so the end of chapter 6 here says, then King Darius wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language in all the earth, May you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, and he endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus, the Persian. Darius here misses the point, just like Nebuchadnezzar in yesterday's story. He saw God do something amazed, and so of course he was impressed, but he wasn't so impressed that he turned only to God and worshipped only the true God. But just like Nebuchadnezzar, I've already got all these gods, what harm will it be to add one more? And so he adds God to his list of gods, and he even tells the rest of the kingdom, look at this amazing God, add him to your list of gods. But he was missing the point, you know, the important point that only God is the one true God. And so when we look at what this showdown reveals to us about God, we see that Darius thought that he was a God. He was trying to control things himself. He was trying to be in charge of his own life. And when you're in charge of your own life, other people get hurt. And um, because he was in charge of his own life, he was worrying, he was fretting, he didn't get any sleep, he didn't eat that night. But Daniel, on the other hand, who wasn't trusting himself, was letting God be in charge, he wasn't worrying. And he was the one who had much more to worry about. He was the one in a den full of lions, but he was the one who probably had a sound night's sleep and he wasn't worrying. And that's because when God is in charge of your life, you don't have to worry. So if you're the one in charge of your life, you're always going to be worried because you're going to wonder, you know, did I do that right? What about the future? And you're going to have all these worries because you think that it's up to you, that you have to make the right decisions. 
But if you give that over to God, if you let God be the one in, your, in charge of your life, then you don't have to worry. And in this story, Daniel was thrown into an actual lion's den. He was in great danger. But when we think about it, Daniel was in great danger his entire life. Just from being very young as a teenager, he was taken away from his home, and he was put into a foreign land that worshipped gods that were different from his god. In fact, he was put into a land that was hostile to his god. So even though he gained high positions in the government, I'm sure that every day of his life, he was in danger because these people wanted to do him harm because they were hostile to the god that he worshipped. But his entire life, Daniel stayed faithful to God. And really, we're the same as Daniel. Um, he was in a lion's den, but he was also, you know, was in danger all the time. And we're too, we are facing the world all the time. They're hostile to God. They want to disprove that he believes. Um, we see all the time, you know, they're trying to get um, God taken out of the schools, get evolution put in. It's a hostile world. But we need to stay faithful, just like Daniel was his whole life to God, and let him be in charge of our life, because if he's the one in charge, then we have nothing to worry about. 